now 12.45 p.m. My Gen Chem 1 class starts at 1 o'clock, and yet there is a snorkel on my head and a coconut in my hand. Well, allow me to explain. You see, today is Friday, which means the weekend's about to start. And being a teacher, I really look forward to the weekends because they're a time for relaxation and rest. And everything just seems to slow down a little bit. I hope that you also have some time in your schedule where things can slow down. But our course is not slowing down. In fact, this lecture, we begin a new topic, the rate of a chemical reaction, which deals with how fast chemical reactions go. Aloha. This lecture begins the third phase of our course, which is the chemical reaction rate. There are many chemical reactions, and they all proceed at different rates. Some are fast and others are slow. But before we can talk about the chemical reaction rate, we need to understand something about rates in general. And in general, a rate is a change in a quantity in a given amount of time. And it's calculated as rate equals delta Q change in quantity over delta T change in time. It should be noted this is an average property being calculated because it's in a given amount of time. Later on we will discuss instantaneous rates and compare them with average rates. And we'll see how the two are similar yet somewhat different. But for now let's focus on the average rate. And so for instance, suppose we want to describe the speed of a car. We can call this V for velocity. And the velocity equals delta D, the change in distance over the change in time. And suppose that a car traveled a distance of 25 miles in 0.5 hours. What was its average speed during that time? Here the velocity equals the change in distance, 25 miles, over the change in time, 0.5 hours. And you end up with 50 miles per hour. Now this was the car's average speed during that time interval. The car could have gone faster and slower during the course of that time, just as long as it went a distance of 25 miles in that time. So that was the average speed during that time interval. Now chemical reactions are described kind of similarly. Let's take a look at this reaction, for example. Hydrogen gas reacts with iodine gas to form HI gas. Now this is our Hawaii state reaction because after all we are forming HI, which is the abbreviation for the state of Hawaii. I use this example quite a bit in my classes here. <laughs> Now there are three species in this reaction and therefore three different ways to describe the reaction rate. And the most popular method for describing the rate of a reaction is change in concentration over the change in time. And for concentrations we'll be using molarities. So for instance, for hydrogen, the rate would be the change in the concentration of hydrogen over the change in time. And there are similar expressions for the other two species. Now suppose we study this reaction and we let it take place in the following vessel. This is a one liter vessel. And at the very beginning we introduce one mole of hydrogen, one mole of iodine, and zero product. And we let the reaction proceed. Now after 100 seconds has passed, some of the reactants have disappeared and some product has appeared and we end up with 0.5 moles of hydrogen and also of iodine and one mole of product HI. Now first of all these numbers should make sense with the stoichiometry of the reaction. Because of the coefficients 1, 1, and 2 if we lose a certain amount of reactant, we should gain twice that much product. And we see that we do. For instance, for hydrogen, we lose one half of a mole, but for the product, we gain one mole. So yes, the numbers do make sense. 
So calculating these three rates, let's take a look at hydrogen, for example. The change in concentration would be the final concentration minus the initial concentration. And because these occur in a one liter vessel, then moles is the concentration. So the final concentration would be 0.5, and the initial concentration would be one. And the change in time would be final minus initial time, so 100 seconds minus zero. And calculating this, we end up with negative 0.005 molarity per second. And it's negative because the hydrogen is disappearing. And it's disappearing at a rate of 0.005 molarity per second. Calculating the rate with respect to iodine, it comes out to be the same, negative 0.005 molarity per second. And this is expected because they have the same coefficients. Every time one of these reacts, one of those also reacts. So they react at the same rate. The product, however, calculating its rate of change, would, it would be the final minus the initial concentration, 10 minus zero, divided by the change in time, 100 minus zero, and you end up with positive 0.01 molarity per second. Now this is positive, and that's because the HI is being formed. And it's being formed at a rate of 0.01 molarity per second, which is a number that's twice as big as these numbers. And that should also make sense because the coefficient is two, so the rate of formation should be twice as fast. Now, there are three different rates here, and we don't want three different rates to describe one reaction. So what we need to do is realize the relationship between these three rates. The reactant rates have a negative sign, and the product rate has a positive sign. And also the product number is twice as big as the reactant numbers. So what we can do is we can take these reactant rates, and if we multiply them by negative one, and we take this product rate, and we multiply it by one half, then the rates become equal. And we could call that the rate of the chemical reaction. To gain a better understanding of the relation between rate, concentration, and time, let's look at some more detailed experimental data and then plot concentration versus time on a graph. So using the same reaction, hydrogen reacts with iodine to form product HI. Let's recall the relation between the rates with respect to hydrogen and iodine and product HI. Remember that if we proceed the reactant rate by negative signs and the product rate by a positive one half because of the coefficient two, then these relations become equal. And if we like, we can call that the rate of the reaction. Now, here's the detailed experimental data along with some calculated rates. So looking at the data first, at the very beginning, our reaction vessel contains one molarity of reactants of hydrogen and iodine and no product. And after 10 seconds passes, we measure the concentrations again and we see that the reactants have decreased somewhat and the product has increased. And we repeat this process every 10 seconds and we see that the reactant concentrations continue to decrease and the product continues to increase. Now, first of all, these numbers should make sense with the stoichiometry of the equation. For instance, because of the coefficients 1, 1, and 2, if the reactants lose a certain concentration, the product should gain twice that much. So let's check that. Over the course of the first 10 seconds, the H2 concentration decreases by 0.181 molarity. 
And so the product should increase by twice that much. And 2 times 0.181 is 0.362. And if you want to check one more, after 20 seconds, the reactant concentrations are now 0.67 molarity, so that's a total decrease of 0.33. It has lost 0.33 molarity, therefore the product should have gained twice that much, 0.66, and it checks out. You can also check the rest of the numbers. They should be correct. Now, along with these concentrations, we can calculate the average rates over these 10 second intervals. So for instance, the average rate from 0 to 10 seconds for hydrogen would be calculated as final concentration minus initial concentration divided by final time minus the initial time. So if we do it for hydrogen, over the course of the first 10 seconds, the final concentration minus the initial concentration, that would give you negative 0.181 molarity. And if you divide it by 10 minus 0, that's 10 seconds, you would get negative 0.0181 molarity. Iodine would end up giving you the same rate. However, the product, HI, would give you final minus initial, that's 0.362, divided by 10 would be 0.0362 molarity per second. And we do see that this number is twice as big as that number, but opposite in sign. So we'd have to multiply this one by one half, and we'd have to multiply these by negative one for them to become equal to each other, just like the relation shows. Now if you continue this process, for instance, going from 10 to 20 seconds, if we do hydrogen, the final concentration minus the initial concentration, 0.670 minus 0.819 would give you 0.149. I'm sorry, negative 0.149. And if you take that negative 0.149 molarity and you divide it by 20 minus 10, which is another 10 seconds, you would get negative 0.0149 molarity per second for the reactants. Now the product will be positive twice that much, and you can also check it by doing the same calculation. You would get positive 0.0298. Now if you look at these rates and you take a step back, you see that these rates are getting smaller. In fact, way down here, from 50 to 60 seconds, the reactant rate is only negative 0.0067 molarity per second. So it's decreasing at a very slow rate. And the product is only positive 0.0134 molarity per second. So it's increasing at a much slower rate than what it started at. So, Let's take these concentrations and plot them versus time on a graph. So here is our graph, and on the y-axis we have concentration. Time is on the x-axis. Now the reactants start off again at one molarity and the product at zero. So at zero seconds we have one molarity for the reactant and the product is at zero. In every 10 seconds, we plot the concentrations. And then we can sort of connect the dots. Now, we see that these concentrations are sort of decreasing. However, it looks like this line may end up leveling off. And that is interesting because Perhaps this concentration will decrease all the way to zero, or perhaps it'll level off at some concentration above zero. So we're not sure about that yet, but we will be talking about that in the future. But for now, let's take a closer look at what we're doing when we calculate the rate. 
Remember when you calculate the rate of change with respect to hydrogen for instance, you're calculating the change in concentration which is the change in the y variable over the change in time which is the change in the x variable. And if you remember from your algebra courses, change in y over change in x when you're talking about a graph is the same thing as the slope of the curve. So for instance from 0 to 10 seconds the change in y for the reactant would be this much. It would be a negative change going from 0 to 10 seconds and the change in x would be that much. And if you take the change in y divided by the change in x you'd get the slope of that line that connects these two points and that would be the average rate with respect to hydrogen over the course of the 10 seconds. And it's a negative slope as you can see. And that makes sense because when we calculate it it's a negative number. Now the product on the other hand from 0 to 10 seconds the change in y would be a positive number, much bigger than the reactant. And the change in x would be 10 seconds. And so when we take the change in concentration over the change in time, we should get a positive number that's bigger than the reactant. And the slope is. It's a much steeper slope. So these numbers right here that we calculated were the average rates from 0 to 10 seconds. And that is the same as the slope of the line connecting the two points. That's interesting, but suppose someone asks, I want to know what the rate of the reaction is at 10 seconds, not over the course of some interval. I want to know how fast the reaction is proceeding right now. Well, the way you would do that for the product, for instance, is by drawing a tangent line to the curve and then the rate would be equal to the slope of that tangent line because in this plot the rate is the same thing as the slope of the line. So the green dashed line represents the tangent line to the curve and the slope of this line can be calculated by picking two points on the green dashed line, maybe a point way over here that crosses the vertical axis and maybe a point way over there and if you measure the change in y and the change in x and take change in y over change in x, that would give you the slope at that point. So the instantaneous rate at 10 seconds is the slope of the tangent line at that point. So that's the main difference between average rate versus instantaneous rate. Average rate requires a certain time interval. An instantaneous rate, it's, you know, just at one point. Now, we've been talking about one reaction, but in the general case, it's always good to generalize. So, suppose we have this generic reaction reactants A and B form products C and D, then the rates with respect to these species would be related by the following equation. The rate of change of reactant A, which is change in concentration over the change in time, that should be preceded by a negative 1 over the coefficient A and the other reactant would be preceded by negative 1 over coefficient b. Now the products get positive signs. Those rates are preceded by 1 over little c and 1 over little d. And if you do that, then all of these rate expressions become equivalent. And you can call that the rate of this reaction. So in this lecture, this short lecture, we've been talking about the definition of rate. And if you recall, the definition is basically the change in concentration over the change in time. In our next lecture, we're going to take a look at a different method for finding the rate of a reaction. 
and that's by the differential rate law. So the next lecture should be a little bit longer, but it's a very important lecture. So I hope you stay tuned for that. Aloha.